Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Vamos a comenzar con una nueva serie que se llama Más Christ. Entonces, si están listos, I'm just kidding, I'm not going to do it in Spanish. Everybody's like, wait, did we come to the wrong service? Hey, so we're starting a new series today. By the way, I'm Joel. Uh, we're starting a new series today called Más Christ. You get it? Christmas. Yeah. Más means more, just in case you didn't know. But uh, we, we were, Pastor Marcus and I were talking about what do we want to talk about for Christmas? You know, and we, we realized we just really want to focus on Jesus Christ, everything gets, we get lost in everything, Christmas gets so busy, and Jesus is the answer. And you know, I heard that my whole life growing up, Jesus is the answer. But I'm 40 years into this walk with the Lord now, and I'm realizing that Jesus really is the answer. If there is anything you're going on that's going on in your life today, this morning, it seems so ethereal, but he has the answer, his birth, his life, The things he taught, his death and his resurrection, hold the answer for everything you're going on that's going on in your life this morning. So we're going to be looking over the next few weeks at a verse, as a promise of who Jesus would be when he arrived. It's from Isaiah, from a book about prophecy, about written before even Jesus showed up. Um, and we're going to be looking at that. So Pastor Marcus asked me this week, he said, what's your favorite Christmas song? And I told him, oh, holy night. And I did not realize that the band was going to do that song this morning. Um, but so first of all, you guys need to thank your worship team extra bunch this month, okay? Because here's why. I used to be a worship pastor, and we always dreaded Christmas because we all love singing Christmas carols, right? But Christmas carols are really hard to play. <laughs> so the band is always like, oh no, it's Christmas songs again. Like, oh, there's still most, you know, most elevation music and Chris Tomlin songs, we do have like four chords. These songs have like 17, and they ain't normal chords. So the band's always like, oh my gosh, I dread Christmas songs. So they take one for us. Our, our worship team sacrifices a lot at Christmas to let us sing the songs we love. So let's thank our worship team. And, and the, the worst part is my favorite Christmas carol, Oh Holy Night, is the worst of them all. It's the hardest one to play. It has so many weird chords, and singing it takes a vocal giant like Jeremiah. So it's a very hard song. So grateful for you doing it. But I wanted to, if we could, there's a line in that that talks right about what we're going to be talking to today. It, I love this, this line. It says, long lay the world in sin and error pining. Pine means to be kind of wasting away, losing energy, just being weary. Anybody relate to that? Just being weary? Just looking around, you're like, I'm just tired. I'm tired of everything changing. I'm weary of all of the fighting around us. I'm weary of all the prices of everything. I'm just weary. And then it says, long live the world and sin and air pilot till he appeared. And the soul felt its worth. When Jesus appeared, it changed everything. And I think we're, we're going to be for the rest of our lives figuring out just how much Jesus changed everything. And then it says this, there's a thrill of hope and that weary world, all of us who are just saying, I'm just tired of all this, rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. And I want to talk this morning about how God is in the process of taking us from glory to glory to glory. There's this verse where Paul says, he says, so we don't lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed day by day, for this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory, which is beyond all comparison. So he says, here's what we do. Because we know that he is taking us from glory to glory, it says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, for what is unseen will pass away, but we fix our eyes on what is unseen, for what is unseen is eternal. And that's the struggle every day. 
fi- keeping our eyes fixed on what is unseen. Because I know this about everybody in this room. You've got some situations in your life that you're looking at them and you're going, how do I fix this? How do I fix this? I've heard some crazy stories this morning. One of the guys in our church, his business burnt to the ground last week. And he's like, right at Christmas, how am I going to pay my employees? And he's just, I'm just in God's hands. I don't know how I'm going to fix this. I've talked to people with medical situations this morning. I was talking, praying with a lady this morning. She's like, I'm just in pain, and I'm tired of being in pain. My feet hurt. My legs hurt. My arms hurt. My back hurts. My neck hurts. I'm just weary of being in pain. How do I fix this? Some of you have got kids that are just like, I don't know how to fix this. I've tried everything I know to do, and I just don't know how to fix this. Some of you, your marriages, you're going, man, uh, we have tried everything. We've gone to counseling. We've done everything. And I, the only way I see of fixing this is just sign a divorce paper. I, but I, I want to believe there's some way to fix this, but I don't know how to fix this. Some of you in your finances, you're looking at it and you're going, every time I think we're going to get ahead, the car blows up with something. It's like, how are we going to fix this? We've all got an area in our life. We're like, how do I fix this? And my, my news for you this morning and I'm going to try and convince you. So if you don't believe me yet, maybe put, think in your mind, what if he was right? What would that mean? My, my answer to you this morning is that Jesus' birth, his life, what he taught, everything he lived is the answer to everything that you're facing right now. Somewhere in his life, death, and resurrection is the answer to everything you're facing. But one of the challenges is this. We all want things to change, don't we? Some of us are looking around at the world and going, we have got to change this country. We are heading in a direction that is no good. We've got to change things. But the challenge with change is this. If you want to start to fix something, when it comes to fixing things, the only thing you can really start with fixing is you. Because, you know, we all want to fix the world, We all see what's wrong with the world, but there's a lot of things going on in our world that you can't fix. And did you know this? You can't change people either. I've been trying, but my wife will not change. (laughs) It's just very frustrating. She's She's a stubborn, stubborn lady. I'm just kidding. What do they say? Uh, This has nothing to do with my wife, but there's a joke. It says, never try to, to teach a pig to sing. It'll just frustrate you and the pig. Uh, Now my wife's offended. I'm in trouble. But anyway, you know, you can't change other people. And and here's the really bad news. You really, practically, you can't change the world. But you know what you can change? You have control over changing right now is you. In fact, Jesus said this. One One of the more, you know, Jesus said some really sweet, loving things we like to put on Hallmark cards. But then there was savage Jesus. And sometimes you come out with these zingers and you're like, Dude, Jesus, that was savage. One of the savage things he said is this. He said, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye. Come here, let me fix you. When there's a log in your own eye, you hypocrite. A great greeting card. <laughs> First, Take the log out of your own eye, and then you can see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. You go, Jesus, that's vicious. Because this is the real challenge, right? It's a lot easier to think we're fixing somebody else, but if you've ever tried to fix you, that's real hard. Some of you have been fighting some addictions. Man, I hear your stories, and you're just like, I just can't beat this thing. And you're weary, and you're tired. And it's a lot easier to project your problems on something else, someone else. And Jesus is like, hey, the only thing you can fix is you. And that's where the real struggle comes. Because if you've ever tried to fix you, like I've tried to fix me, it doesn't come easy. You just keep going back to those old habits and you're like, I'm doing this again. I kicked myself last time I did this. And you just walk around discouraged, frustrated with yourself. And sometimes if you don't want to look at yourself, you just blame it on other people. And Jesus all the time is saying, hey, I came into the world and I want to fix it. And I want to start with you. And this is where the verse comes in. 
in Isaiah where there's this promise. He says, you know, every one of us, we're walking in darkness. We've all got some darkness in us that we know. You, you know that darkness in you that you're like, you keep it pressed down most of the time and then your kid does that one thing and you're just like, <laughs> and you go, what is wrong with me? Is there like evil lurking inside of me? What is this thing that I'm doing? I'm uh, like, who is this person? And your spouse is like, Ugh. like, who is this? We've all got this darkness in us, and there's this promise in the, verse, the book of Isaiah, and it says this. It says, the people who walked in darkness, it's all of us, have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, and some of you know what this means because you've been feeling so much anxiety this year. You've been feeling so much depression. Some of you, it took everything you had to even turn on the TV and watch online or even come to church today. You've been in this deep depression. You're like, I just don't see any hope. It's not going to get better. He says, even you who are in deep darkness, the light has shown. For unto us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. Now, this line right here could change some of you's life. Because some of you are so frustrated and stressed because you're watching the news all the time and you're seeing the insanity in the government and you've taken it on your shoulders, and you aren't strong enough to carry it. But Jesus is. He came, and it says the government's on his shoulders. Yes, you vote. We live in a democracy. But some of you are so worried about changing those things. And listen, you need to focus on changing you. Because as we all change ourselves, the world changes. And some of you are carrying this weight of, oh, what's the government going to do next? And I get it. It affects us. But carrying the weight on your shoulders, he's the one that's supposed to have that on his shoulders. It says, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. What's interesting, in the Hebrew, they don't have the same punctuation we have. And it actually, want, it actually could say he's just be called Wonderful, period. Full of wonder. You go, what is he up to? I did, we talked about that last week. I don't know what he's up to, but it's full of wonder. But the version we're going to use today combines Wonderful and Counselor. And I want to talk specifically about what a wonderful counselor looks like. It's kind of something that's close to my heart because I, have, I went and got a master's degree in counseling. And uh, I learned a whole lot about what makes a good, wonderful counselor. And uh, when I was getting my master's degree, you have to get 700 hours of counseling in to get your master's degree. And one of the things we have to do is you have to actually, with the consent of the client, record one of your sessions, and then you take it back, and the class critiques your counseling session, whether you did a good job practicing the skills of counseling. I actually got really lucky. I didn't want to uh, do like a lot of clinical counseling. I actually got lucky, and I was fortunate enough to work with the kids that have been detained by ICE, by immigration, the, kid, you know, the kids you see in cages. Um, that's nothing new. That's been going on for 15 years. It's just all the presidents have done it. Everybody's just using it for political fodder now. But those kids that come across the border by themselves alone, um, I grew up in Guatemala, so I have a real heart for those kids. A lot of them actually know friends of mine. <laughs> it's kind of funny. And they would come into counseling, and, and I got to counsel those kids. And it's, it's a fascinating experience because all of them are named Juan Martinez. Um, <laughs> that's, what the, that's what the coyote will actually tell them. Don't give them your real name. They'll say, call yourself Juan Martinez. So every kid, he's like, what's your name? I'm like, okay, de verdad, cuál es tu nombre? And what's your real name? You know, and they'd be like, well, I'm not going to tell you. But after I get to know them, they would open up. And I heard some crazy stories. And one of the dictums, the main kind of keys of counseling is they say this. It's, they say it's the relationship that heals. You know, you may not be the most skilled, eloquent speaker. You may not know all the skills of counseling. But if you'll take the time and pour love into a relationship, it's amazing how much healing that can bring to people. And I found as these kids got to know me, they found out I was from Guatemala. Some of them came from the very town I grew up in in Guatemala. They knew people I knew. It was a weird experience. They would open up to me, and they'd tell me all sorts of tragic, horrible stories. But my goal was to, to, to just really minister life to them as, as much as possible. And I would ask for their permission to, to record the session. And I'll never forget one, one, um, one session I couldn't make my class. So I went to my advisor, and I said, hey, I can't make the class. And she said, why don't you come to the ones who are about to graduate their, their final session, and we'll just put you in there so you don't miss a class. So we came, and uh, had, everybody had our little tape. We had to put it on a little tape. And, we, we listened to a bunch of sessions, and we listened to this one lady. She was about two weeks away from graduating, and it was the most horrible counseling session I've ever heard. She was belittling. In fact, this girl was like, I've been feeling so much anxiety. And she's like, well, you have nothing to be afraid of. There's nothing to be anxious about. 
Why are you anxious? That's ridiculous. Let's look at those false, like foolish fears. And I'm like, this is, this is horrible. And everybody's like, oh, yeah. Nobody commented on it. I'm like, maybe it's just me that thought that was a horrible counseling session. Because one of the things in counseling is they call it unconditional positive regard. Like you have to, you, you don't ever judge the client or they won't open up to you. And so I, I, I was, afterwards I went to the teacher. I'm like, hey, that was horrible, right? And she's like, yeah, it was pretty bad. I was like, are you going to let her graduate? She goes, well, it's too late now. How are we going to stop her? And I was like, and I had this reality. Somewhere out there in the world is the world's worst counselor. And it may be your counselor. <laughs> you know the really scary thing? Somewhere out there is the guy who graduated last in medical school, and you know what they call him? Doctor. Doctor. <laughs> There's some reassurance. But I got to thinking about, you know, there's a difference between a, a bad counselor and a wonderful counselor. And, and Jesus promises that he is the wonderful counselor. He comes in the relationship. And that's why he came to earth, because he knew that just declaring things from on high wasn't going to cut it. He needed to come down and walk with us, be in relationship with us. And that relationship is what heals. And that's why we as Christians, we believe this is more about re than about religion. You know, religion's a set of things you follow. People all the time are like, are you very religious? I'm like, actually, I'm not very religious. I don't like religion. But I love relationship with Jesus because he gets me. He came down. He walked this earth. He came in the form of a baby. He lived everything we've lived through. And his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection are all an example for us of how to live. Jesus came down. And he said, look, I'm not just going to tell you how to live. I'm going to show you how to live. And this is why it's so important that we read the life of Jesus. And I would encourage you this December, man, attempting to just read the Christmas story. But I would encourage you, and get into your Bible. Maybe you had dusted it off. You haven't read it in a while. Read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Wouldn't take that much to read through them. But spend some time reading the life of Jesus. And look, you're probably going to go, I don't understand some of it. Welcome to the club. Neither do I, and I'm supposed to be the professional. Like, stuff Jesus says, I'm like, what in the world is he talking about? But I'll tell you this. The more you're in there and you read it, you'll have life situations come up where you'll go, oh, that's what Jesus was talking about. And I wish he would have been more clear and gone, here's what to do when you find your kid is stuck on heroin. He doesn't. But there's examples in there of how to relate to people. And as you study that, we believe as Christians, because we're in relationship with Jesus, that he will actually reveal to you things that you couldn't have understood on your own. I don't know how it all works. Again, I've been hanging out in church for 44 years. Don't understand how it all works. But that's what faith is. Faith isn't, yes, I believe all the right things. Faith is an awareness that there's something beyond what you understand. And when you tap into that, there's power, and it's God's power working in you. And, and, and faith believes that God's way works even when it doesn't seem like it would work. Because if you look at Jesus' life, he asked us to do some stuff that you're like, that's absolutely ridiculous, if we're honest. When somebody abuses you, turn the other cheek. That doesn't work, Jesus. I'll just get even more abused. But that's what he says. Again, it's one of those uncomfortable things that I don't like. I wish he wouldn't have said it, but he did. And one of the challenges, and this is where people are like, you know, sometimes when we look at the Bible, you, you have to basically conclude that when you're reading the Bible, either the Bible's wrong or you're wrong. That's an uncomfortable fact. And I've concluded that usually when I read the Bible and there's something in there I don't like, it's because I need to change my mind. And when I change my mind and get my mind in life in line with what Jesus has taught, it changes the way I live. That's the beauty of what Jesus said. He said, look, I'm, I'm coming as a counselor. I'm going to build a relationship with you. And, and through my life, I want to show you how you can relate to God. God's not mad at you anymore. I want to show you how you can relate to God. And this is what he says in, in this verse here. He says that Jesus cried out. It's one of the few times it says Jesus cried out. He says, whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. So he says, if you believe in me and the message I'm sharing, the truth that there's something beyond that faith, that there's something beyond what makes sense, that, that is like a greater truth that will lead you, says, if you believe in that, me, man, you believe in God. He's the one who sent me. And whoever sees me 
sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I don't judge him. That's what a good counselor does. They don't judge, remember? They just point the way and they say, hey, this is the way forward. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. It goes on. The one who rejects me and doesn't receive my words, he has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And know this, I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. When you listen to the words of Jesus, he will show you the way to live the life that is not only pleasing to God, but that actually brings you fulfillment, a sense of purpose, and a sense of peace. But that's really hard to believe because a lot of what you read, you go, that's impossible to do. That is just not possible. I'm going to get run over. I'm going to get abused. I'm going to get beaten up. And Jesus says, yeah. And look, I did those things and I got abused and got beaten up. And even got killed for it. But what came on the other side was resurrection life. And that's where we believe this world isn't all you're living for. There's something greater. There's something more that God has for you. And you have to trust that promise when you're going through the struggle you feel like you're being taken advantage of. You're doing the best to follow the words of the Lord. You know, G.K. Chesterton, he said this once. He said, the Christian ideal hasn't been tried and found wanting. It's been found very difficult and left untried. Most people, they abandon Christianity because they realize this thing Jesus asked me to do really requires a lot of faith that it works because it doesn't seem like it's going to work because I've lived long enough to know that if you turn the other cheek, they're going to slap you on the other cheek too. But the answer is in there. And Jesus says, hey, if you want to have more, be generous. You go, that doesn't even make sense. If I want to have more, I hang on to what I've got. No. He says, if you give it away, it will come back to you, pressed down, shaken together. And you go, that's so counterintuitive. And that's the faith we believe in. The beautiful thing is Jesus came and he lived out a life that showed us how that was, how to do that. That's what a counselor does. They don't judge you. Jesus says, I don't judge you. And some of you feel like you've been judged by Jesus. But know this, Jesus doesn't judge you. Now your conscience judges you. Conscience says, you know you're better than this, and you do know you're better than this. And that's where the other part of who Jesus is comes into play. You know, we've heard that, you ever watch these law shows and they call them the attorney counselor? What would you say? Another form of a counselor is an advocate, someone who advocates for you. And there's this verse in 1 John, I love this. He says, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. He's like, Sin makes you weak, it destroys you, it totally, it, it takes the energy out of you, and it's not good for you. Don't do it. And then he says this great line, which I'm glad is in there, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So how many of you know, man, we do sin, don't we? Anybody here sinned this morning? Jeremiah, what was yours? I'm just kidding. You don't have to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> he is the propitiation this propitiation is a big word big theological term it just means the payment he's the payment for our sins and not for our sins only but also for the sins of the whole world and there's this really cool verse it says when you accept the gift of Christ it says God gives you a new name and he, oh, he's the only one who knows that name I was like why is God the only one that knows that name and he said well I asked a preacher this one time he said well here's why brother he said Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. He goes before God and he's like, look what Joel did again. He screwed up. And here's what God says. I don't know who Joel is. Joel died back there at the cross with Jesus. The guy that lives now, he's got a whole other name. He was crucified with Christ. And I ain't going to tell you his name because you can't accuse him. Jesus is our advocate. He's the one that when God looks at you, all he sees is the righteousness of Christ. And you say, that's impossible. I feel so shameful and dirty. I feel all the things I've done. I, mean, I know what I did last night, and I dragged myself into church anyways. And he says, yeah, but you know what? The way you're standing before God has not changed if you've accepted the gift of Jesus Christ. He looks at you in the fullness of who he believes you can be. So our mission now, our job on earth, is really to become who we already are. You go, wait, what? In God's eyes, you have the righteousness, the perfection of Christ. The fullness of all you could be, God sees you for that. And all you've got to do now is step into all he says you already are. 
And that's the journey of a lifetime. Stepping into who you already are. But the call is already there. And that's what this gift of Jesus is an advocate. Another verse that says, we don't have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weakness. Jesus is a high priest, you know. Nothing worse than a preacher that you can tell they're preaching something that they actually haven't lived. I can't stand preachers like that. I'm a pastor's kid. And I'd be like, that guy is just preaching stuff. He does. He's never actually lived that. And you know it. It's hollow. It's shallow. But Jesus, when he talks, he can talk with authority. He says he, he's able to empathize with our weakness. But we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. If you think about Jesus, man, he, he went through it all. And his death, man, it's the worst possible death anyone could have. He was betrayed by a friend. He was tortured. He was spit upon. He was accused of lying. All the things we're afraid of. He was cast out from his own people, his own family and friends. They, they turned on him. He had the worst kind of death. But he lived for something greater than that. And that's what we're all called to do. He says, you know, this, this world isn't all there is. There's something greater. And I'm aware of that. That's that faith. I'm aware that there's something greater that we're living for. And he lived for that. And he says, so I'm coming down. I'm going to show you the way to fix it. But fixing it starts with you. And that's why most of us end up at counseling. They say, you know, why do most people end up at counseling when they've come to the end of themselves and they're like, I can't take it anymore. How do I fix this? And that's where Jesus steps in and says, let me show you the way. I'm going to show you the way to the Father. And not only that, I want to let you know, I've walked the path you're walking. And I know that there's glory on the other side of it. So my prayer for you guys this, this, this uh, Christmas season is I pray that you would just dig deep into who Jesus was. Don't get distracted by all the hubbub and the noise and stuff. Every morning, take some time to just get that Bible open and read the story of Jesus. And you may get to a point where you're like, what in the world is Jesus talking about? Trust me, I get there a lot. Jesus and Paul, they said some weird stuff. But know this. The words have truth that maybe aren't truth for where you're at right now, but that truth doesn't mean it's not true. It's going to be truth that's going to carry you through in every season of life. And as you know the words of Jesus, he's going to give you insight into how to live the life. And that thing you're trying to fix right now, he's going to be the answer to that. And it sounds so simple, but it's, it's a challenge of a lifetime. That's my encouragement for you guys this, this year, that, uh, this week. You know, our next year, we sat down with Pastor Marcus and the staff this week, and we, we felt like we're trying to figure out what the, the message is for Crossroads next year. And we feel like this is our slogan for next year. There is more. There's more for you. Ephesians, there's a verse that says, I pray that you would know how deep and how wide and how great is the love of God in you and that you would see that his love is exceedingly abundantly far above all you could ever ask or think. And I believe we're coming into a season this year where you're going to see some things happen in your life. If you'll believe, if you've got that faith and you're following Jesus, where you're going to go, I can't believe it can get this good. I believe there's going to be breakthroughs for some of you. Some chains of addiction are going to come off and you go, wow, I never, th I thought I'd be struggling with this the rest of my life. I believe there's going to be healing. There's more for you than you can even imagine. Exceedingly, abundantly, far above all you could ever ask or think. So my encouragement for you guys is let's focus on Christ because he's going to be the answer that leads us to that more. And then over the next year, I believe there is going to be more in your life, more healing, more strength, more encouragement, more hope more love, more joy, more peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, all those things that you, you know you want, I believe that God has that for you, but it's only going to come through Christ and his work as we lean into him. That's my encouragement for you guys. Let's spend this month focusing on Jesus. Just dig in, read those verses, and believe that next year is going to be a year. There is more to come. The best is yet to come. The path of the righteous, like the light of dawn, shines brighter and brighter. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much that you sent Jesus, man, the form of a child. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, the government's on his shoulders, and he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And I thank you, Lord, that this month, I believe you're going to be showing us mas Cristo, more of Christ, because yeah. he is the answer, he's the hope of the world. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings. <laughs>